Somebody that I know reached out to me and was like, hey, I really hate to like name drop, but Stevie Wonder has been trying to get a spice box. And I said, now what? He ain't got to wait for no box. What do you mean? Like Stevie Wonder can get a box today. Yeah. We can overnight his yeah, box. Yeah. You are the only one in your immediate family who has never been incarcerated. At yeah. some points in my life, my mother, my father, and my brothers were all incarcerated wow. at the same time. So it was just me. From a girl who was doing payday loans and taking jeans back to Nordstrom, <laughs> you have been able to create something, really something quite magical. You've generated multi-million dollars worth of revenue for businesses, black businesses in the DC area. We have a non-compete model. So if you are applying to sell your shea butter today and somebody else is already selling shea butter, we don't let you sell it because the goal is for everybody to get money. The goal yeah. is not to put you in a space to compete with somebody else that looks like you. We do yeah. that enough. You know, you go to these events and there's a vendor marketplace yeah. Set yeah. up and you see all the products, it almost tricks you into thinking that this is all we know how to do. Because you look around yes. and it's like, dang, all we know how to do is make candles and shea butter. Yes. But when you experience the spice suite and you see our <laughs> list of vendors and it's like, oh no, we do everything. What do you feel is missing in the space of entrepreneurship with black businesses? Welcome to Vault Empowers Talk. So we don't just scratch the surface, we dive deep into the lives of some of the world's most influential change makers. I'm your host, Brandi Harvey. But before I introduce my guest for the day, I need you to go ahead and do me a favor. I need you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss your daily dose of inspiration and motivation. But without further ado, this is one in the making. I'm so excited. I get to introduce this phenomenal woman sitting across from me. Angel Gregorio is the founder and owner of The Spice Suite, a growing community-centric spice boutique located in Washington, D.C. Along with The Spice Suite, Angel is the founder and owner of Black and Forth, the first Black-owned strip mall in the Washington, D.C. area. Having hosted more than 4,500 free pop-up shops for Black businesses in the last eight years and creating the Dream Incubator, a community business school, Angel has made it her mission to hold sacred space for other black businesses and foster ideas of collaboration. As a former charter school vice president, Angel has demonstrated a long-standing commitment to improving the lives of the city's most vulnerable youth and families. Angel's commitment to the community aided in her helping to bring to life the commercial property acquisition fund in the city of D.C. Angel and her businesses have been featured on a variety of local and national media platforms, including including The Drew Barrymore Show, Essence Magazine, Travel and Leisure, Sway in the Morning Show, NPR, The Washington Post, and Bon Appetit, just to name a few. Angel believes you should pursue freedom relentlessly, all while lifting as you climb. Vault Empowers Talks welcome home cook, activist, educator, entrepreneur, mother, and freedom fighter, Angel Gregorio, to the show. I, I am now taking your bio as my own. <laughs> That's my new intro everywhere I go. <laughs> Listen, I want you to feel that way. We were talking off camera. I mean, yeah. this is our, you're my Instagram friend. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's we're, so good to see you in real we're life. We're Instagram friends. <laughs> and I, I have to say, you know, I feel like I was introduced to you fully. And I mean, on a nonstop constant repeat during the pandemic, yep. uh, we got food at home. Yep. Listen, <laughs> every day I was checking for what is the recipe on We Got Food at Home, okay? Yep. Yeah. I think that, like, We Got Food at Home resonates with everybody, but specifically with black people, right? Yeah. Like, I think as a child, yeah. at some point in our childhoods, all yeah. of us remember riding past some fast food place asking, can we stop? Can we stop? And somebody in the driver's seat saying, we got that at home. Yeah. We got food at home. And yeah. so when I started to set, type that on Instagram, it just kind of caught on. And I was like, okay, so there is this shared black experience. Like we all understand this yeah. statement and I don't have to explain it when I say it. No, because <laughs> listen, the son and the daughter, you have two children. I do. Bro daddy. He he, <laughs> he, he, he the daddy and the, and the brother, okay, <laughs> to your little one. Yeah. They are involved in the cooking experience. Definitely. But but, I mean, you were this young girl growing up in D.C. You you come from a family of four four children, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are the only one in your immediate family who has never been incarcerated. Uh, yep, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my brothers, I have two brothers serving life in prison. Um, and then I have, you know, my parents have both engaged in the, in the criminal justice system. And somehow I've escaped it, right? And I don't even, like completely understand how, right? Because genetically, yeah. I should have. 
um, socially, we are the same people, right? My brothers and I have the same hustle, the same grit. It's very similar mindsets. Yeah. I am my mother and my father's child, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. I'm not too far for, too far off from them. But somehow, um, I ended up on this path um, that took me on to higher education at Howard University. And I had some friends who grew up very different than I did. And I decided to follow the path that their parents set out for them. And it led me to become a Spice Girl. <laughs> I mean, b before you became a Spice Girl, though, and somebody was bringing you kilos of spices <laughs> from around the world, yeah. you know, you had you had your first job at a youth jail. Mm -hmm. And you said that that was you wanted to be the example that your brothers didn't have. And that was how you wanted to show up in the world. Yep. Um, that was my first. I always call it my first like real job. Right. Yeah. When you get your first like salary position, yeah. that feels like a real job. And it was at teaching at um, Oak Hill. It was called Oak Hill. It's now called New Beginnings Youth Detention Center. And it was a place where my brothers had been. My little brother, I would go see him there on the weekends. Wow. I was there as a visitor. So I was familiar with the space. And then um, while I was at Howard, I thought I wanted to be a forensic psychologist. In my mind, I was going to be like Clarice on Silence of the Lamb. Like that was my, <laughs> I wanted to get into the minds of like the craziest, wildest people. Yeah. Um, and that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. And when I started working at the youth jail, I just wanted any entry point into the juvenile justice system. So I was like, whatever job I can take, I'll take it. And I ended up um, as an assistant teacher. And the principal at the time was like, I think you should lead a classroom. Like you can command the classroom. These boys listen to you. You're smart. Like yeah. I think you should take the praxis and get certified to teach. And so I took the praxis with the test you have yeah. to take to become a certified teacher. I took the praxis one and two and passed it and became a math teacher. And I fell in love with education. I fell in love with the boys and that group in particular, right? Because they're like the most forgotten. They're yeah. the group that nobody yeah. wants to teach. It's like if yeah. you took all the kids in a yeah. normal school and you went to the principal's office, that was the principal's office. Like yeah. that that was my classroom, all yeah. the kids who were getting put out of class. And I loved them so much. And I saw so much of my brothers in them. And I always thought every day I would go into work, it was like, I have to show up as a person that I wish my brothers were able to see when they were in this system. Yeah. Because if they had somebody who genuinely loved them, cared for them, and was there for all the right reasons, perhaps something along their trajectory yeah. could have changed. Yeah. And both your brothers are serving life sentences. They are. So is no chance of parole for them? There's always hope. Yeah. Right. Like there's always an opportunity. Um, I have um, helped out with some legislation in D.C., um, IRA, that could possibly bring my brothers home. And so they are awaiting appeals to be able to have their cases reheard through that. And so the hope is that one, if not both of them, have a chance to come home. It's just, you know, yeah. not certain, but yeah. it's possible. You talked about that. You talked about that the grief mm -hmm. that you experience and your family experiences, like when people go away because... Yeah. You know, most of the grief that we talk about is when people die and yep. they pass on. Yep. But this is the grief that you can, you know that they're there, but you can't touch them and you yeah. can't really see them the way you want to. It's a very interesting way to grieve somebody who is still alive. Um, and I don't, you know, most, I think a lot of black people who grew up in inner cities, who grew up in D.C. in yeah. particular, yeah. know folks who yeah. are incarcerated. Yeah. So it's not an unfamiliar thing yeah. for them. But a lot of us don't, right? And not anyone this close to you or to have this many people, right? At yeah. some points in my life, my mother, my father, and my brothers were all incarcerated wow. at the same time, wow. right? So it was just me through college. So it was just me trying to figure it out, figuring out how I was going to get books. And I didn't, I never did. Uh, but just grieving them is, it's an ongoing thing. It's something I deal with every day. And what I also recognize is how it impacts my ability to celebrate myself, right? Like I know that I suffer from survivor's remorse. Like it is mm. difficult for me to celebrate some of the really cool things that I've done in, in a real way because I want to be able to call my brother mm. or I want to be able, you know, I want to be able to celebrate with the people closest to me, but they don't have the capacity or the ability or they just physically aren't here yeah. to be able to do it. And so it just makes it really hard because while I want to be excited about what I've done, it's like, dang, but how come he didn't get a chance? Yeah. Talk about what you've done, what yeah. you, what you've been able to do yeah. in the city of DC, which is create a model mm -hmm. of really black business on a whole nother level. Yeah. And so from a girl who was doing payday loans and taking jeans back to Nordstrom. Oh, you read all the things. <laughs> <laughs> you read my diary. You read <laughs> the girl who was getting the payday loans yep. and taking jeans back from North to Nordstrom that would, she they never got from Nordstrom. Nordstrom. <laughs> okay. That was a, listen, you, you have been able to create something, really something quite magical in DC. Yeah. With, I mean, from your own business of creating this this space in a 
auto body shop mm -hmm. with this empty parking lot mm -hmm. and transforming it into the spice suite, which is now really an incubator for multiple, multiple black businesses. Yeah, it is. Um, I think just sometimes I shock myself at my ability to see things and see them through. Right. Like I think a lot of us have a, we see things, we, we have visions and we close our eyes and we dream, but we don't always see it through for yeah. a myriad of reasons. Right. But when I saw I told um, I remember telling um, Council Member Kenya McDuffie, who um, introduced the commercial property acquisition fund that you mentioned in my intro. I remember telling him that I wanted to buy a commercial space. My, my landlord in my old space, it wasn't working out. I was like, you know, what? I need to get out of here. I want to find a space, but I want to buy something if I'm going to move. So we put that in motion. And then I called my friend um, who was a residential real estate agent. And I was like, you need to help me find a space. And she's like, but I don't do commercial. And I was like, well, just take me to look at some places, right? Yeah. And so I saw this, I saw maybe three other places. And then I saw the old auto body shop that I ended up purchasing it. And the day that I saw it, I remember she and her broker, we walked into the space together. And this place had experienced a fire. Like it yeah. was dilapidated. It was gross. It was, there was nothing pretty about it. And I'll never remember. I'll never Never forget Bruce saying like, I don't know how you gonna pretty this up. Like, yeah. <laughs> like this is just, it's a mess. But I literally walked in and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna take all the walls down. I'm gonna paint the whole thing black. I'm gonna do this and that. And I'm gonna have the shells and I want them to float. Like I knew exactly what I wanted the space to look like the moment I walked into it because I was able to see it. And then my friend was like, okay, so like what's next? And I was like, well, you have to help me get the space. And she's like, but I'm not a commercial agent. And I was like, well, if anybody's going to get this commission on a seven-figure deal, it's going to be my homegirl. So you got to so figure it out. Was this the $1.3 million it space? Was. This yeah. is $1.3 million. Yeah. So I was like, you got to figure it out. You had good credit. I did. <laughs> 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 and the pandemic was good to us. Um, yeah. I mean, as you know, you know, as you know from finding out about us through the pandemic, yeah. um, you know, at a time where people weren't necessarily like Uber Eats felt sketchy. Yeah. People weren't really going out to eat. Everybody was cooking at home, and so our business really took off. And so I reinvested that revenue during, from the pandemic to be able to buy the space. And so I, of course, financed the space, but I was able to do the construction um, in addition to a, loan, a grant that I got from DC government. I financed my entire construction with revenue from the store. Yeah. So about 1.1 million was my own money and then another million from DC government in a wow. grant. Wow. I wanted people to talk about the store because this spice suite was yeah. not just, oh, I, I just want to get into spices. Mm -hmm. Your friend was traveling, mm -hmm. brought you kilos. This kilo. See, some of y'all <laughs> going to get out here and get confused. <laughs> but she had kilos of spices mm -hmm. that were given to you. Yeah. And you started playing around with them. I did. So when I, like, I never had an idea, a vision to do a spice shop. Like, that wasn't the vision that I had. I just randomly decided to call the landlord and embark on this space because it was affordable. In yeah. my mind, I don't even know what affordable was because yeah. I didn't have any, you know, any barometer for that. But I decided to open this spice shop and I was like, okay, like, I think I can do this. And I started, of course, posting about it on Facebook yeah. or Instagram. And there was this guy, Boat, that I met. He was a comedian. I met him in the grocery store and he wasn't trying to holler or nothing. We just like connected he yeah. needed help find it like picking out something in the grocery store and you know Facebook is creepy you see somebody <laughs> in the grocery store and all of a sudden they're like a person you might know right I'm like yeah because I just saw him five minutes ago so he pops up as a person I might know yeah. we end up becoming Facebook friends we have mutual friends so yeah. it just made it less yeah. creepy right and so as I was posting about opening this spice shop he hit me and he was like yo you know like you helped me out in Safeway one day um I'm about to be over in Kuwait if there's um, anything I could do, I'd love to send you some spices. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, that'd be nice. I didn't know what he was yeah. going to send. Had no I, no expectation. And when the package arrived, it was so fragrant. I was like, oh, my God. Before I even opened it, I literally remember sitting in the old shop in this window seat thinking, like, wherever he got this from, this is what I have to do. I have to go somewhere else to get my spices. Yeah. Like, this is how I'm going to do it. And so I set out to start traveling the world for spices. And now I've been to about 40 countries um, for spices and spice inspiration. I mean, first of all, y'all don't even know. Like, I'm, I'm uh, why I know I'm a believer is because I got the spices. <laughs> Me and Carly was like, we would be stalking <laughs> your page when you would drop the boxes. So she started dropping these boxes yeah. during COVID. And you had the syrups, the infused mm -hmm. syrups, the 
I mean, we was trying to get everything because <laughs> she's shaking it on the recipe. You like, oh, that looks so good. I don't even eat salmon, but baby, I'm gonna give me some salmon. Listen, it was so. Cra- I mean, the pandemic. It was such a crazy time with the boxes. Yeah. I remember. I remember when you and I when we connected um, over you guys trying to get boxes, and it was a similar thing with um, somebody that I know reached out to me and was like, "Hey, I really hate to like name drop, but um, Stevie Wanda has been trying to get a spice box." And I said, now what? Now he ain't gotta wait for no box. What do you mean? Like Stevie Wonder can get a box today. Yeah. We can overnight his yeah, box. Yeah. What do you, I mean, I was just like, what do you mean? Like, how are the people like this aware yeah. of what I'm doing here in DC? Like, I knew I was making impact in my city, but to know that people well beyond DC were learning about me was just like super overwhelming for me. Oh, it still yeah. is. Yeah. It still is. I mean, we wanted to know what the kids was eating that day. We wanted to know what was for Sunday brunch. We yeah. was tapped in. Yeah, everybody. I mean, you know. What kind of syrup? What jalapeno chili sauce <laughs> syrup she got today? It yeah. was so, it's, it's been so much fun being able to introduce people to like fun flavors. And the fact that people know that while I take my business seriously, I still play with my food. Yeah. I yeah. still have fun with my food. And people trust me enough to take this journey with me and have fun with their food too. And play. I always tell people to like play in your closet in your kitchen. And yeah. people have been doing that with me. And it shocks me because I'm like, I don't have a culinary background. I've never, yeah. I don't have the credentials that says, you know, I know what I'm talking about. But people trust me and believe me. And the proof is in the product. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, from biscuit mixes, pancakes and waffle mixes, mm-hmm. infused syrups, yeah. you know, mixed spice blends you know ketchups Mm -hmm. you know all kind of sauces I think you know you have found a lane and you have really owned it you know but in you owning your own lane you said let me take some folks with me on this journey and so one day your child had a hockey match Mm -hmm. a hockey game Mm -hmm. and you said well can you stay in here and run the store for Uh me and that really gave you the black and forth market. Yeah. So I, um, I mean, that's exactly it. I was at the old location. And at the point when I first started, it was just me, of course. Right. I couldn't afford staff. I could barely afford the spices. So I definitely <laughs> couldn't afford the staff to be able to staff the place. So my hours, it was so weird because I was still an assistant principal for the first like two months that I opened the space. So my store hours were literally only on the weekends mm. because I was busy all week. And that's not sustainable for a retail space yeah. to only be open on the weekends. Weekends. Then I finally quit my job, and then my store hours were only after school. Yeah, be, I mean during school because yeah. I had to pick my kids up, my son up at that time after school. So it was so weird. I kept changing things and trying to figure it out. And then eventually, I figured out something that worked for me. Um, one day, I was sitting in there and I would host these pop up shops. I will post on Instagram that if there's any black business owner that has a product that's handmade or uniquely sourced, you can come in here and bring your product and sell it. No charge, no fine yeah. print. You just bring your product. And so I had a, f- a lot of people interested in that. They would come by. And then there was this one girl, Nikki. Um, she came and she popped up. And she had a good time. Her products, I think, like sold out or something. And she was like, oh, my gosh, I had such a great time. Do you mind if I come back again? And I was like, yeah, come back. And then it happened again. And she was like, she wanted to come back. And then I was like, okay, look. So I feel like we kind of know each other. <laughs> You've been in here with me. I trust you. Yeah. I feel like, you yeah. know, can you run my register for yeah. me and allow me to, like, step away and go to my son's hockey game while you run the shop for me? And she's like, oh, my God, of course. Like, I would love to do that. I don't. It's chill in here. It's easy. You know, it's a small shop. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, cool. And after being away for a day and finally experiencing like freedom Freedom. while in entrepreneurship, like that wasn't something I'd experienced yet. I was like, I need more of this. This is when I was like on this relentless pursuit of freedom. And I started thinking, like, I wonder how many other people would go on this journey with me and do the same thing. And I just give you a regular recurring space to pop up and sell your product. And in exchange, you help run my shop for me. And that way, I don't have to pay for overhead. And so I would do these interviews early on. And I would talk about it. And I would say, like, I'm bartering with black people. And we're doing this thing where I give them space. And they give me time. And I got a call from the U.S. Department of Labor's legal department. Yeah, And the guy on the other end was like, hey, so I heard that you are doing this barter. And I was like, yep. And he was like, so we don't see any um, anything between you and the IRS that communicates that you are bartering. And I said, well, that's because I lied. Because if the IRS is involved, then I clearly lied. Because I don't need, I, whatever they need, I don't want. I'm good. I was like, I don't want it. I, I made a mistake. April Fool's. What, what do we, how do we fix this? And he was like, he was like, no, no, no. I'm not trying to catch you up. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to trip you up. Like, just tell me what you're doing. Explain to me what you're doing and let me figure, help you figure out the path forward. 
And so I explained to him my business model and what I was doing. And he was like, young lady, I have been doing this a very long time. I have never heard of this model that you're doing where you're not charging people at all. There's no contract. There's, you know, it doesn't yeah. fit any, I think he said four or five different legal employment types that we define as the government. Um, so it doesn't exist. And I was like, so the IRS isn't involved. And he yeah. was like, based on what you're telling me, no. And so I hung up and I was like, yo, so if this doesn't exist and this is working for me, then I need to create a name for it and I need to own it. And so I decided to call this model of going back and forth with black business owners black and forth. Yeah. And so that became the name of my business model. And then fast forward to me purchasing the commercial property when they decided that it was um, considered a strip mall. I had to come up with a name for the strip mall. So I called that black and forth. So now black and forth takes on multiple meanings. Yeah. But it all kind of started with that scared straight moment on the phone with, <laughs> with, the, with the Department of Labor. Yeah. Yeah, trying to tell me that, you know, I had to not use the word barter anymore. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have just found so many ways to pivot, mm -hmm. so many ways to turn the corner. Yeah. And I think that that's often, you know, and I've heard you talk about this in, in a few interviews about, you know, when we talk about success and knowing when to walk away when things aren't working. And But you have just really found so many ways of how to turn the corner and to do something new and reimagine what it looks like. Thanks. I received that. Um, I think that, you know, in an interview I did with Carla Harris, um, we did an interview with for JP Morgan, for Morgan Stanley, sorry. And she and I were talking a lot off camera, and she, you know, was saying something similar. And she was like, I work with a lot of, like, Fortune 500 CEOs, and, you know, I coach them. And she was like, you know, there's this thing you have the ability to do that a lot of people don't have. And I was like, well, what is that? And she was like, you decide. Hmm. And ever since she said it, it's like stuck with me. And she was like, you decide. You make decisions and yeah. you don't think, you don't sit in it for a long time. You don't like wallow in yeah. something when yeah. it goes right yeah. or wrong. You yeah. just decide and you yeah. get stuff done. And I realized yeah. that like that's a determining factor between some people in business, right? Like pivoting is one thing, but the decision to pivot, yeah. before you even get to pivot, you have to decide that this is what yeah. I want to do. Yeah. But that is, for me, I always just said I was impulsive, right? And that's how I would have described it. And it wasn't until I talked to her that she gave me new words and language yeah. for to describe how yeah. I move and how I think. And it is really just the, the way I execute um, on things. And I'm grateful for that ability. And I think it just comes from this like um, fearlessness that yeah. I have yeah. that allows me to decide quickly. Yeah, decide quickly. Mm -hmm. The fearlessness. The dream incubator that you've created, uh -huh. you know, you have been very clear yeah. that I hold sacred space for black businesses. Yep. Now, you can come in here and shop and patronize and love on these products, yep. but there are a few spaces for us, yep. and you've created that space yep. unapologetically. And, uh, yep, and it's so important to me um, to say that, you know, even now at a time with DEI is under attack and, you know, folks are, are being um, chastised and even reprimand, you know, um, punished in some ways for their relentless um, pursuit to support and uplift black people, I'm still going to do it. Uh, because we need spaces that are our own, right? And like and like you said, it doesn't mean that other people can't come shop with us. We absolutely welcome anybody to shop with us. But when it comes to the people that we position for our pop-up shops and to be Spice Girls and even my tenants, right? Like now that I have tenants that occupy the shipping containers um, at my strip mall, I needed those to be black people because I know that we get discriminated against way too often, yeah. off jump, just because we're black, right? Like nobody cares. And I also remember that I was given a shot years ago, you know, eight and a half years ago when I wanted to open the Spice Suite. I had this random idea for this thing I wanted to do and look at what it's become just because I had a space and opportunity. Yeah. So if I have space and opportunity to offer, then I'm going to absolutely offer it and I'm putting us at the front of the line. Yeah. Talk about the, the the containers. You have four container mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. These are shipping containers yep. that you have turned into businesses. Yep. You have two hair salons, mm -hmm. a nail salon, a wax studio. Yep. They only have to pay for their rent. You cover utilities. Yes. So they pay $2,000 a month, which is a flat fee. Um, and I cover their water, their electricity, their Wi-Fi. Um, because the goal is that... If you have this flat fee every month and you and your other bills fluctuate, then it's hard to be able to scale and grow, yeah. especially when you're, you know, some, they aren't starting out. Most of them are not starting out. They are established businesses, but it's hard to, it's hard to grow when things, I mean, even when you think about your own personal finances, right? It's like, dang, I got a little extra money, but then it's like, I don't know what 
this yeah. electricity bill going to be yeah. this month. Let me yeah. hold off. Yeah. But yeah. when you know what your expenses yeah. are, it just makes it easier for you. And I want them to grow. My goal is for them to grow their businesses, to maybe employ some other black men and women at their businesses so that we can all, you know, like create this domino effect and how we grow um, each other. That, you know the DMs just went up. Okay, you know they they about to be they about to be in the comments. I got a business, Angel. You know they gonna say they got I a business. Know. Somebody got got some in their basement right now. But you have yeah. an application process for the people who come through to Definitely. do pop ups. Yeah, and you are vetting seriously, of course, tenants who come into the space. Definitely. So the tenants are absolutely seriously vetted um, because we want, you know, we want folks who are also going to be there, right? Like we can't, we don't want folks who are not serious about their. You business. just started last week. Don't no, don't DM her. Stay no, on her inbox. Wait. Yeah, <laughs> wait, wait a little while. <laughs> wait a little while. But for the pop ups, though, you're more than welcome, right? For the pop ups, we don't vet those at all. For the and I know people think we do because a lot of people will say, I've been trying to pop up for months and I haven't been able to get a slot. It's not personal. I don't even look at it. My team looks at the, at the pop-up list and it doesn't matter even if I don't like the product. Like, mm. I walk in sometimes and I look at the table and I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting what you're selling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, girl. <laughs> right? I, I, it's not for me, but you have an audience, right? So it's yeah. never personal. So yeah. I never want people to think that like, yeah. oh, she didn't choose me because she doesn't like my, yeah. you know, whatever. And that's totally not the case. We allow anybody to pop up. It really is like a matchmaking thing and whether we have a non-compete model. So if you are applying to sell your shea butter today and somebody else, or maybe a Spice Girl is already selling shea butter, we don't let you sell it. And we do that with everything, even our farmer's market. Because the goal is for everybody to get money. The yeah. goal is not to put you in a space to compete with somebody else that looks like you. We do yeah. that enough. So in the Spice Suite, if you sell shea butter and candles and earrings and somebody else is selling shea butter, then homegirl, leave the shea butter at home, bring your candles and earrings and pull up. Yeah. Like, let's figure this thing yeah. out so that we can all, yeah. you know, grow together. I love that. When yeah. I heard that, I was like, that is so perfect because how often... Are we in? There's so many uh, black markets that have started to pop up, especially in different cities. Yeah. Of course, you had a village market here in Atlanta yes, with Dr. King, who Key. you know, love who her. you know. Um, and then we have the the Black Friday market mm -hmm. up in Cleveland, Larice Purnell, mm -hmm. you know, um, who's been on the show. All of these places, I feel like, don't have that. Yep. And I think that is such a a, a, a major factor in yep. the success of those businesses because you go to places and it's a whole line of body oils, yep. it's a whole line of yep. uh, uh, candles, it's yep. a whole line of, you know, a certain food product. Yep. You know, and you know what's interesting about that? I feel like when we walk into these spaces, you know, you go to these events even, and there's a vendor marketplace yeah, set up, yeah. um, and you see all the products, it almost tricks you into thinking that this is all we know how to do. Because you look around yes. and it's like, dang, all we know how to do is make candles and shea butter. Yes. But when you experience the spice suite and you see our <laughs> list of vendors and it's like, oh, no, we do everything. Yeah. Like, we've had people pop up that do literally everything, yeah. right? And even amongst the Spice Girls, they don't compete with each other. So we have 25 Spice Girls who don't compete. So that's 25 different businesses, and they all have varying products. So I feel like we, and it pushes people, right? Because yeah. sometimes they'll see that and they'll say like, okay, you know what? Let me go back to the drawing board because I do notice that there are a yes. 20 other people selling this. Yeah. What else can I create? Because yeah. I know that there's something. And the goal is to find a gap in the market and fill that, like fill that space with something new and innovative and creative and not try to do more of what's already been done. Yeah, that is the part right there. Because you do. I mean, you. we're here in Atlanta, and I swear you go to these places and uh, everybody got shea butter. Everybody. Everybody got a body butter. Everybody got a hair oil. Yep. Yeah. You know. Yeah, with little rose petals in yeah, it. Yeah, everybody got the same thing. I got yeah. some. Grow your locks. I know yeah. you do, girl. I know you do. Yeah. It, it, but that's the part. We do so much more. Yes. You know, we have paper mills. We have stationery. We have We have technology pieces. Yeah. We have so many things. Yeah that we aren't really show, showcasing that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and black people do everything. Like we are the center of creation and innovation, yeah. but I feel like sometimes we are also, um, we also try to take what's easy, right? Like we try to take the easy route and it's easier to replicate than it is to innovate. And so sometimes we do that. Ooh. Um, <laughs> and it's just, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Even like with the farmer's market, right? Like farmer's markets are the same way. Yeah. You go to farmer's markets and everybody has peaches. Everybody has oranges. You just decide which one you want to get it from, yeah. right? Who yeah. claims to have the freshest, yeah. sweeter ones. But at our farmer's market, all the vendors are black and we tell them the same thing. You have to submit your list a week in advance so that we know what you're bringing so that we can decide 
decide who's going to bring tomatoes this week yeah. because we don't need all your tomatoes. Now, if it's a different variety of tomatoes, then pull up. But please don't think that we're about to have you at a market with a bunch of the same things. So we also don't need a whole lot of vendors. We don't need 25 vendors just to make it look like it's a big market. Like our property is small. You come to our black and four farmers market and there's 12 vendors, but we have everything that the other markets have. We just don't have the competition. Yeah, I love that. Talk about the pull up, the pull up method, uh -huh. because <laughs> you started doing these classes uh -huh. in your living room uh -huh. that were really people who you knew who were successful in their field, be it uh -huh. marketing or branding or whatever it was. And yep. they were leading these classes in your living room, which yep. is now, you know, become this whole dream incubator yep. of classes that are with wait lists and standing room only. Yeah. So um, with the Spice Girls, you know, as a former educator, I was always trying to teach and learn, right? And I, and I didn't know what I was doing in yeah, business. So I yeah. really kind of had no choice yeah. but to learn some yeah. things or this yeah. was going to fail. Yeah. And so when I started out, I was like, you know what? I need to learn how to do bookkeeping, marketing, social media. Like, I didn't know how to do any of these things well, but I knew some dope people who did. And so I told the Spice Girls we would start doing these monthly meetups at my house. And it was an opportunity for us to all get together because they pop up on different days. Yeah. So we were all a part of this group, but they all didn't know each other because they sometimes would never see each other until they got to my house. And so I would bring them to my house. I would cook. We would have wine. Um, and then I would just invite a friend or someone who's an expert in some subject area to come and put a PowerPoint up on my TV and we would learn together. And that was just our way of breaking bread together, of holding space for each other and building community. And every time I would post a photo afterward, just to kind of thank the person yeah. who came in, yeah. I would post a photo on Instagram. Um, there would be people in the comments on my DMs like, oh my God, I want to come. And I'm like, read the room. This is my house. <laughs> like, I don't even know you. Like, you can't come in my house. Yeah. And so, you know, but I also knew while I would say that jokingly, at the core of that was somebody saying, I also want to learn. Yeah. Right? Like, me too. Like, teach me. Yeah. And so, me understanding that when I was able to acquire the new space at Black and Forth, it was this much bigger space. And one of the very first things that I did, I think within a couple of weeks of opening, was decide to host what I call Community Business School. And so I took it from my house, where we used to just call it a Spice Girl Meetup, and started calling it Community Business School, which is the premise that I believe we have enough genius in our community to grow our community. Yeah. And so I call on that genius to come into my Spice Suite now, once a, or twice a month now, and they teach these classes, um, and we can all grow together, and they're free. And they'll always be free. I'll never charge wow. people to come to class. Um, and these classes are taught by folks at DC government. We've had folks from MasterCard teach classes. We've had my friends from Howard, my friends from all over. Like people will come. I've had friends who are in town for the weekend and they're like, girl, you know what? I got an hour and a half I can spare on Thursday. Yeah. I'll come and teach a class. Yeah. And they will come and teach these classes. And we had a certain number of spaces because I only have a certain number of chairs that we can fit into the space. And some classes would fill up and people would be like, hey, the class is full. If there's, is there a wait list? And I'm like, you know what? There's no need for a wait list. If you really want to learn, then you'll stand. And so I would tell people, mm -hmm. if you want to come, just DM me, pull up, and we'll respond and say, pull up. And so that was like, that's yeah. the only thing we yeah. say to each other is, I want to pull up, and I'll say, pull up. And they will come to the class, and they can just stand around. Some folks bring their children to class, yeah. like babies yeah. to class, yeah. and we just learn together. Yeah. And I come to the classes, too, because I'm still learning, yeah. and we learn together. This is, I mean, this is what I love so much and why I was so excited about you coming on the show, because... When we talk about building community, we talk about, you know, group ep economics, we talk about, uh -huh. you know, how do we rally and pool our dollars uh -huh. and pool our resources together. And you are like, you need to start exactly where you are. Yep. Do it where you are. Yep. I yep. mean, you're like, I'm going to take whatever I have and I'm going to do it right here. Yep. And do it because you know it's the right thing to do. Right. Yeah. Like I'm not doing this out of protest. This wasn't in response to George Floyd. Yeah. We were doing this before that. Right. Yeah. I wasn't buying, I, I've been buying yeah. black before that. Yeah. I've been supporting yeah. black before that. Exactly. Um, and because I know it's the right thing to do and because I know it's a necessary thing to do. Yeah. Uh, we can't grow our businesses if we don't learn. And not everybody can take time off to go back and go to actual business school at a university yeah. to learn the things that they need to know. And honestly, I feel like there's more genius in our community business school than there are in some of these more formal, um, you know, in these formal institutions. But I know that sometimes people are, um, they are so caught up on like the optics and the celebrity. I think there's so much celebrity around yeah. giving now, yeah. oh. right? Like if you, yes. if they're on cameras, if there's not yeah. somebody to catch yeah. it, if you're not sure that the class is going to yeah. fill up yeah. and it looks full, right, then you don't want to do it. 
And we, I tell people when I start every class, um, I try to be there for every class that we have for community business school. And we start on time because yeah. I'm real big on time. Yeah. I don't like to be late. Yeah. I don't like wasting people's time. Yeah. And there could be 10 people in there or 100. And I always tell them, we're starting with us. Yeah. And whoever pulls up, continue. They can come in and they can grab a seat and they'll be late. But I don't, I'm not canceling class because five people registered yeah. this week. Yeah. Or, you know, and I'm not hiring a, a film crew because 500 people showed up this week. Yeah. Like, we are doing this because this is what we do here. Yeah. 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 This is what we do here. Yeah. This is what we do. When you look at the businesses that are in Black and Forth right now who have mm -hmm. been partnered, because you've done over 4,500 pop up shops mm -hmm. over the last eight years. Um, and you've generated quite a lot, of, I mean, multi-million dollars worth of revenue for mm -hmm. businesses, black businesses in the D.C. area. You know, what do you feel is missing in the space of entrepreneurship with black businesses? I think that there is still a lack of um, people willing to support in kind. In kind. In kind, right? Because we, we will we will support and yeah. we will host yeah. a, a conference. Yeah. You know, we, I mean, we yeah. we the kings and queens of a conference. Ooh, you know, a we, summit, love a, we love a, 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 a summit. A, a day. We love uh -huh. a women's empowerment something <laughs> and ain't empowering nothing. Like, we love it, right? <laughs> we, we love a ticket. We love a, an opportunity to Listen, sell a ticket. <laughs> 1197, 1997, Listen. and you can come be empowered. We're going to move you to... No. It, and, and, and I mean, but that's real. And I feel like what's missing is more of us that are willing to say, I can donate my time and talent for the betterment of community. Yeah. Right. And not a lot of people do it. Even when I talk about my business model, I talk about it all the time because I want people to adopt it. Yeah. I don't gatekeep my business model. Yeah. You know, it's not this secret thing that I'm doing. It's work for me. It has allowed me to grow this into a seven figure business. And I'm proud of that. And I always say that to people because I want that to be the proof that it works. And every single time I, I've talked to business owners who had brick and mortar businesses that were closing and ended up closing and try to tell them like, this is what I did. This is what you can do. This is how you can build it. This is how you build out your group. Right. They don't have to be spice girls. It could be men and women. I would talk them through it and they would always say, but for free, hmm. you want you let them pop up for free? Yeah, I let them pop up for free. And they got keys? Yeah, they got keys. And they work your register? Yes, they work my register. But how you trust them? I could pay them or not. I still have to trust somebody with the keys to my register, yeah. the security code to get in here, yeah. to be around my product. Me mm -hmm. paying you is not going to abdicate you of your moral responsibility not to take advantage. Yeah. Right? It, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I'm doing this because this is what's going to help grow yeah. us in a way that makes sense and is sustainable. But people still don't trust it. People will say, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to do that too. I'm going to start hosting pop-ups. But I'm going to charge them something because people aren't going to take it seriously if you don't charge them. If they don't take it seriously, they don't take it seriously. If they don't yeah. come, they don't come. Yeah. I have yeah. to pay this mortgage whether they pop up or not. Yeah. So it doesn't matter to me. But we yeah. are so, I don't know if it's like we're scared or we're selfish or what it is, but we are so reluctant to simply give without receiving something yeah. in return from people. Yeah. And it's, it's wild to me. Yeah, it's hard. I think I think it is the the trust factor. I mm -hmm. think it speaks to the competition factor, mm -hmm. you know, that you, that you talk fair. about. You know, um, I host a, a health uh, seminar every month mm -hmm. uh, with my business partner, Jacqueline Glass. And, you know, we had 250 women, you know, show up to the, it's an online class. Yeah. 250 women. And it does, like, for me, it's like, and I think that's that same, that's why I feel like all these chills and this, like, bubbling up every time you're talking is because you understand that somebody is walking away with something that yeah. is going to impact their life. Yep. Somebody is walking away with something that they are going to see a vast difference in their life yeah. because of this. And yeah. that has to mean something to you for that to be enough, right? Like that's enough for me because yeah. that means something to yeah. me. But for other people, it's like, but still, but my bills, <laughs> but yeah. you know, but this mortgage, but, but what about this? But for me, it's like knowing that I have a hand in allowing somebody else's dream that they didn't know they had yeah. to come to fruition yeah. just yeah. because they got space and yeah. opportunity yeah. Um, means the world to me. And I'm sure a lot of those businesses, you know, maybe give an example to the audience about 
how that has really kind of come back to you tenfold because you opened up the door and gave somebody the keys. I remember um, Chantel, she's, I think she's down here. Play Pits. Play Pits. Her very first pop-up was yeah. at the Spice Suite. Yeah. She had never done a, a pop-up before. And I remember her being like nervous about her pop-up um, and coming in. And I don't know if the nervousness was around like sales or just the people. The yeah. It's a lot, right? Yeah. Like you, you got to interact with people. You're the face of your product. Yeah. Um, and you're putting something out there for the first yeah. time. But I'll never forget her hosting her first pop-up there. And now she's in every Target in yeah. the country. Yeah. She has blown up. Her business is wildly successful. It's still the only deodorant I use literally yeah. since the day I, I met her. I am I am a play pits person myself. <laughs> I love her. I run into her at all the events here yeah. in Atlanta. She's yeah. amazing. And look at what she's been able to do, yeah. right? And granted, her success wasn't because of the Spice Suite, but yeah. just knowing that like we created space for people like her to be able to launch and grow their businesses, I, it always makes me sp smile yeah. thinking about her. First of all, like her story is just absolutely incredible. Am it it yeah. is. It's amazing. And to notice she got her start with you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, you kind of like, you know, you the Harriet Tubman uh, <laughs> uh, 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 business world. You over here leading people to the, <laughs> to the promised land. land. I only, the one, only the ones that want to go, right? Yeah. With the, the quote, right? Harriet could have yeah. freed more if they only knew. Yeah. It's like, it's like so many other so many yeah. people don't want to come along on the journey to, because what I'm doing is like, I'm not necessarily freeing people. I am really just trying to like, teach us how to be free. Hmm. I don't hold the key to your freedom. Yeah. I'm just here to like show you what it looks like to be free. Like I am free. I feel so I control my time, my energy. I do what I want to do yeah. on most days, you know, yeah. to be able to fly down here yeah. and fly right yeah. back. Yeah. Like I'm grateful for that type of autonomy over my life now. Um, and I really want other people to be able to experience even a glimpse of that. Yeah. In a part of that freedom, you know, what, you know, what routine have you had to kind of adapt and adopt every single day that allows you and affords you that freedom? You know what's interesting? I do not have any routine. I literally, I she think don't I just work talk, out, y'all. I, I know nothing is. I know we <laughs> talked about that off camera. I don't work out regularly. Like if I work out, it might be I'll work out. For Jada, maybe my producer Jada is shaking her head right now. <laughs> She's not doing it physically, but in her mind, she's shaking her head. She's shaking her head. She got her I, blueberries back there. Listen, yeah, I literally will work out for maybe like a couple of days. You know, maybe February and March, and then I like literally this happened. I worked out a couple of times February and March, and I haven't been back since. Like I just. I can't stay consistent with it. And routines for me, they just feel so monotonous and boring. Mm -hmm. But part of me would like to establish some sort of routine. I, I mean, I've talked about this with my therapist. Like, I don't even have a routine like having coffee in the morning. Like, okay. some people have even that. Yeah. I don't even do that. I don't drink coffee. I don't even have that as a routine. My days are not the same. There's yeah. nothing. I mean, outside of, like, hygienic things, right? Like, there's nothing that I do every single day. Mm. I don't have any routine in my life. Yeah. It is. I live the most sporadic, <laughs> random life ever. And I think all of my decisions in business are kind of indicative of this randomness <laughs> <laughs> that but is I my think life. That that's the freedom, yeah. you know, of yeah. you being able to choose that and it not being dictated for you yeah. or to you. Yeah. yeah, I could I could bring some things under control. I could probably drink some tea in the morning or something. <laughs> so you you just mentioned therapy. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure as a business owner, this requires some time on the couch Absolutely. to re recalibrate. Yeah, yeah, because life is wild. Yeah. Life we like <laughs> life we like it for yeah. sure. Um, and therapy, I think, is something that is. Um, it's one of the places, one of the things in my life that allows me to be extremely selfish yeah. and feel good about it. Yeah. You know, going into it and coming out of it, it makes me feel really good. Um, and I am grateful too to even just be able to have the time and resources for that. My degrees are in counseling psychology, right? right. I have my master's in counseling yeah. psychology. So I've always been an avid, you know, proponent of therapy and counseling. And I know that it is effective and it works. Um, for me, it just took me so long to find a good therapist mm. because I also, you know, kind of like when we talk yeah. about like interviews and interviewers, you have, I mean, clearly done all the research, right? Like, you know, all the stats, <laughs> like you're not reading notes or anything. <laughs> so you get it. Right. Yeah. And for me, it's like having done a lot of interviews. I can, rec I can recognize a good interviewer having had my degrees in counseling psychology. I recognize a good therapist. And sometimes I would say things in past therapy sessions and I would kind of be sitting there like, you should have asked me a different question after that. Yeah. Like, I know what I need to arrive at. You're not asking me the right questions. And so I would just check out and I would stop going. And then I would go years without going to therapy again. And then recently, I literally told myself, like, this is important. 
yeah. you need to do this and you need to date therapists yeah. until you find yeah. the right one and don't let this go until you know don't yeah. let all this time lapse yeah. in between yeah i'm in that i'm in that place right now where i i was i was i have been out of therapy for some months now mm -hmm. and this is the longest that i've gone without consistent therapy in yeah. the last seven years of yeah. my life and so it's been interesting but I reached back out to my old therapist, like, hey, you know, I want to get back on the books. Yeah. But I don't even know if, if she's, I don't know if we in love anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm it's saying? It's literally like dating. You know, I, yeah. I don't know if we still in love. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, listen, and yo. I think the beauty of it is you get to be polyamorous in this, in this therapy <laughs> thing. Right? And you get to do all, you get to yeah. live all your wildest dreams yeah. and have threesomes and all the things. You have multiple therapists if you yeah. need to and yeah. get what you need, yeah. right? Because the goal is to get what you need out of it. Yeah. And so you keep yeah. going until you find the one that works for you. Yeah. That's, that's the place I'm in right now because I... You know, I have been like each time I'm like, hey, let me get back on the calendar and it never works out. So I think that's always for that's me. Fine. That's always a sign yeah. when it doesn't flow in, you know, automatically, you yeah. know, and naturally it's like, OK, that's just it's time for you to find someone else. Yeah. So what would you tell somebody as someone who is a clinical psychologist? You this has been your your life's work. What's the first thing you would tell our audience to in looking for a therapist? I think you need to, I mean, first make sure like the demographics and things line up for you, right? If you want a black person, a white person, a man, a woman, you know, age, like all those things are just like super important. And I think we push those aside. I'm looking for a black woman. Yeah. Okay, and go and ahead. I mean, even if age matters, <laughs> right? Like for me, I want it. I could, I can't, my therapist can't be my age and you can't be younger than me. Like I, I can't, because baby, what are you talking about? Like, I, I don't want to accidentally call you baby in therapy because I think you're a child, right? So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I need you to be old enough that I feel like I can respect your opinion. And not only do you have some, like, um, you have some academic knowledge, but you yeah. have some life experience that yeah. is coming in this session yeah. that I can yeah. respect and honor. And so I think that's yeah. important. But I think the one of the biggest things would be what we just said is to date them. You know, and that's in everything. Anytime you're making a big decision about a person that is going to serve some key role in your life. Yeah. I tell people this with acquiring commercial property. Date the lenders. You don't just go to one bank. You go to multiple and you see who feels good, who treats you the best, who has the best yeah. offer, who's whining and dining you, so to yeah. speak, right? And the same with therapy. You date a couple of them and you figure out, like, who's asking the really good questions, who's conversation flows freely just like dating like it's so wild how similar these things are to yeah, dating yeah. but when you get in that mindset I think it makes it easier for people because dating is something we can all relate to right even yeah. when I talk about my spices I talk about them like dating sometimes I'll tell people like you can mix and match them you don't have to be faithful you know they yeah. don't have to be in committed relationships <laughs> with one another you can have yeah. fun with it and it's the same with everything else yeah yeah how was it finding balance as this like entrepreneur mother, you have all these commitments and mm -hmm. tenants and all the things that people yeah. that are pulling. How do you find balance in your life? Having amazing people that I can put in place and really allowing them to do their jobs. Mm. I think sometimes yeah. we delegate and we build teams, yeah. but then we do the work of all the teammates, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? So it's like, what yeah. good is it yeah. to have, you know, four or five people on your team, but you're still doing their jobs, yeah. right? My assistant responds to the emails. I'm not jumping in her inbox responding to the emails on her behalf. I let her do that. My operations team, they receive the shipments. I'm not showing up with a box cutter anymore <laughs> on a day of shipments, opening boxes. Yeah. I'm like, hey, y'all, send me video so I can post it on Instagram. Yeah. I don't need to be there, but you got to find people that you trust, and then you have the balance. And before you get to that place, right, because yeah. I know, you know, eight and a half years ago when I first started, there was no team. Like, yeah. I was the team, yeah. but I still had to find balance. And that's when I say uh, what you spoke to earlier, which is that the thing you seek the most is what you will pursue the most relentlessly. And for me, it was freedom. And so I immediately started to put things in place for my business that allowed me to be the most free. So yeah. that was creating my business model. So you yeah. just got to identify what your real priorities are. Yeah. And that is the thing that you got to put your energy into. Yeah. What's what's next for the Spice Suite and the black and forth market? What's on the horizon? I don't know. I feel like this journey has been so wildly serendipitous <laughs> that I could have never predicted any of it. And I've loved every moment that I'm almost scared to speak over what could be next because I feel like the universe is plan for me is bigger than my own capacity to dream for myself. Mm -hmm. 
I yeah. can't even fathom what could be next for me. Yeah. And so it's almost like I don't want to say it because I know my words have power. And I know I have the power to manifest most everything I say. Yeah. And I feel like I might say something that's too small. So yeah. I don't even say anything. I just go. I just yeah. flow. Yeah. You just show up to life and, and let up. it do what it do. Yeah. yeah. And just have fun. That's why you ain't got no routine. You that's just... exactly why. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly why. My golf, I take golf. My golf instructor, I'll text him like, hey, Mr. Ted, you got some time for me tomorrow? And he'll be like, only you because i'm the, I just, it's never scheduled it'll just be like i think it's gonna be I, nice out tomorrow I'm i should know off. what is your golf outfit like because oh, baby you know, i already know you you're not going out there with the simple visor no. and the white shoes mm. and the little it's, it's very dramatic <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very dramatic. Yeah. It, it's it's giving yeah. it, it it make I, it, I should play a lot better based on how I show up. <laughs> Let me say that outfit outfit yeah. wipe me down yeah. and then be like, out there like mm, was that my ball? Because <laughs> that went over there and it was, okay, but it's cool. But I look cute. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like that's a great that's a great thing that you've added to your life. Golfing is I very it. relaxing. It is is putting you in position, of course, even with your business to yep. do more business. Oh, yeah. I love it. And actually, Robin. Um, who owns Ball Alert? Robin got okay. me into doing golf. She was telling me how much she golfs and she would post about it. And I was just like, I'm like, this seems so cool and so fun. And she's like, oh my God, you should do it. And she's like, I'm hosting a golf tournament. And I was like, all I need is something to get ready for. And so yep. she gave me that deadline to get ready for the tournament. And so I started taking these lessons repeatedly to get ready for it. And I went to the tournament, yeah. had a ball. And then I was like, now I'm in love. Now I can't stop golfing. I oh, love wow. it. I love it so much. So you make time to golf during I the week. I do make go time to golf. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, that might be my routine right now. Yeah. I've been golfing weekly a couple times a week. Look at that. Yeah. See, because I'm so glad that you said that because so often we don't even put ourselves in certain spaces, right? Yeah. Because we don't think that we belong there. Yeah. I mean, and there is such a resurgence of black women who are golfing. There's yep. so many black female golf clubs yep. around the country that are popping up. Yeah. And I feel like you give our audience, certain people in our audience who might be listening who are like, Maybe I can do that. I can show up with all my colors and Absolutely. I can show up with with my locks yep. and I can show up with you know, a red lip on with, with yep. a red lip yep. in my clubs. <laughs> Listen. Yes. Yeah. I think that we have to be comfortable knowing that like we belong everywhere. Yeah. We really do belong everywhere. So any space that has us should be grateful to have us. Right. Like just be grateful that especially as a black woman, like be grateful that a black woman decides to grace your golf course. And when I see black, I, it's very rare that I see black women golfing, even in D.C. That is God is approving black this message right now. The thunder <laughs> is going down right now here. That was God saying I approve Amen. this message. OK, just so y'all know. Yeah, It's like every time I'm on the golf course and I see another black person, you know how we do this thing. We just like smile at each other. Yeah, or you you yeah. have to speak. You go yeah. out of your way to yeah. speak to them, to acknowledge their presence. Um, but I love it. There's a lot of black men out there, and even they get excited to see me, you know, yeah. on the golf course. Yeah. One because they like, look, man, what you got on today? <laughs> <laughs> the older men, the older men get a kick out of it. <laughs> it's then like, girl, <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. Okay, as we begin to close out this interview, what's one word you're committed to in this season of your life? One word that I'm committed to um, is expansion. Mm. And not just in my business. Um, I wasn't even thinking about my business, really. Even just thinking about myself. I want to just expand um, the way that I allow myself to receive. Um, you know, I talked about the survivor's remorse. It impacts my ability to celebrate, but it also impacts my ability to receive compliments. Mm -hmm. um, genuinely, to yeah. receive gifts. Um, to receive people that genuinely want to show up and love me. Um, and so I really just want to like ex expand my ability and my capacity to receive. I love that. You know why um, a friend of mine, Dr. Sherry Riley, she was on the show and this was at one of our super friends brunches. She said, you know, I've been praying big and I've been believing big, but I haven't been receiving big. Mm, yeah. And she said in this season, I'm receiving big. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'm adopting that. Yeah. I love it. Because it's important. Because it I think is. we have all these big dreams. We have all these big ideas, all these big goals that yeah. we set for ourselves. And sometimes it's hard. I mean, I was just having this conversation with my team afterwards, you know, before you got here. You know, I said sometimes I feel like the things that come into my life because of 
who my father is, right? Mm. Sometimes you lessen everything that comes to you. Mm. Like, well, I mean, it's not big enough. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not that yeah. big. I mean, look at, you know, you yeah. seem big, yeah. right? And yeah. sometimes you're like, ah, that's not big enough. And you know what's interesting? Being on the opposite end of that, right? It's like having come from nothing, hmm. things seem big to other people. Like everything I do seems big. Yeah. And I'm like, but... I, I, I've been around people who done bigger things, right? Like, but the people who grew up with me, the people in my family, like I might be the biggest thing that they've seen, yeah. right? But I get to sit in spaces with you and I sit in spaces with other women and men and I'm like, nah, mm-mm, I seen some <laughs> yeah. stuff, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, it can yeah. get better. Yeah. Like, it can get better. Yeah. And yeah. so I think there's just always room for better, yeah. Yeah. right? There's always room for us to dream bigger yeah. and go harder, um, and push ourselves more while celebrating ourselves at the same yeah. time and, and finding the balance between those two things. Yeah. I think it's something that um, most of us definitely, I know I can, I need yeah. to do better at. Yeah. As a, as a mother, you know, of two children, a boy yeah. and a girl, mm -hmm. you know, what is the one thing that you want them to know about you? I want my kids to know that their mommy showed up as her full self everywhere she went. And I think that is so important because, you know, my, my kids are keenly aware of, not keenly, right? But my, my, my son in particular, he's, he's 13. My son is aware somewhat of like the way that I grew up. Like he knows that his, 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 how his grandma is. He knows that his brothers, I mean, his uncles have to call collect. He knows that they're locked up. And so, you know, we have not had the conversations yet about, um, like how I am the way I am or mm -hmm. how I got to be where I am. But he's definitely said things to me in the past about um, like, dang, like what happened with Uncle Harold and Uncle Harrell? Like you ain't you ain't never want you ain't never do nothing wrong. Get, you know, and he's he's thinking he would think that I was perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, nope, I'm not perfect. Like this is this is exactly who I am. And I never wanted my son to think that I was like fronting or I was living this double life where I was yeah. like, you know, this good girl in front of him. Cause there was one time even when he came in to my house and my son went to my room and he was like, it smelled like weed in your room. <laughs> And I was like, but I don't smoke. He was like, but it smelled like weed in your room. I was like, but I don't smoke. And he's like, yeah, all right. Like, he didn't believe me. And so I was like, I had to have a side conversation. I was like, hey, I really, I don't smoke. Like, I wouldn't lie to you about that. He was like, I don't know. Because sometimes I feel like you be fronting. Like, you be wanting me to think that you don't be doing nothing. And you really do. Like, we got all this liquor and you don't drink and you don't smoke. And I was like, no, I really don't. And I thought about that. And I was like, no, I want you to be confident that, like, this is who I really am. Mm. Like, who I present to you is how I really am. Like, I don't do the things yeah. that a lot of your aunties and uncles and, yeah. my, you know, my friends that yeah. we call aunt uncles and aunties and things do but this is me and he was like all right and so I was like go back up in my room so I walked up there with him and he was like maybe I don't know it did I thought it, it smelled like I, it did smell like weed at first I'm like no it didn't and like it's almost like he really wants yeah. to like catch me in this moment of like yeah. you're not perfect wow. and I'm like I don't want to present as perfect to my children mm. but I do want to present as my full self Wow, that's really big. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you're a therapist. You can? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I would be listening to you on your Instagram. I'm like, she used language that says she's done some shit. Oh, like, I kind of know this, okay? Yeah, so, no, it, it's perfect. Yeah, to show up as your full as your full self. Yeah. Yeah. Especially to our kids, because I feel like they we try to be so right for them, right? Because we want to be the example for them, but they need to see all of us like they need to see and they don't need I don't I mean I still believe in kids being shielded from certain things at certain ages right and conversations not being for them but it is so important to me um like my son knows my heart for service and community um he knows that when I have my annual birthday cookout that his mom is twerking in the backyard he don't need to see it but he knows of it right like he knows that like this is your mama like certain songs come on and I'm like boy that's I knew that song that song been out and I'm rapping the lyrics and he like but I thought she was like an Erica about do fan. Boy, I can do both. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like I listen to all the things. Yeah. And so I just want him, I want my kids to really know me because yeah. I didn't get that opportunity with my mother yeah. to like really know her. Right. And I don't think she really knows me either. Yeah. And I really want my kids to know and understand me um, beyond just like the spice sweet and who the world says I am. Yeah. Oh, that is really big. I, I love that. One piece of advice you will leave our audience, whether entrepreneurs, mothers, whether they are just this boss,
advice, girl? <laughs> uh, my advice has been consistent. Um, for the past eight and a half years, I leave the same two pieces of advice, which is start now, perfect later, um, so that we don't get in our own way. Because I think sometimes we are so busy trying to make things perfect that we don't realize that um, perfection is the illusion of progress. You're not really making progress while you're trying to make something perfect. And to be careful who you dream out loud around. Mm. Um, and I always have to say this to say that, like, I don't mean because I think people are haters, right? I don't even really subscribe to that. But I do believe that sometimes it's hard for people to see for you what they can't see for themselves. And so you're mm. so busy, you know, dreaming out loud these, like, really lofty, amazing things that you want to do for yourself. And your homegirl, your friend, your mama, whoever is on the other end of that, and they're questioning you and they're doubting you and you think that they're hating on you. And it's really a reflection of their inability to see something that big for themselves so they don't they don't think that you can't do it they just literally can't fathom it yeah. and so you just got to be careful who you say things around um and at, at what time you say it right if you're not fully confident in yourself because if you're saying it with and your confidence is shaky and the person on the receiving end is asking you questions then you might be like you know what never mind you're right yeah versus like i it's cool i know you don't understand but i, I was just letting you know what i'm about to do yeah expansion Start now, perfect later. Yes. Be careful who you dream around. Yeah. Who you say it out loud to. Angel, it has been my pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. This is Instagram. This <laughs> this somebody who they post to be. Okay. <laughs> you know, some of y'all out there, y'all ain't who y'all post to be. And she actually shows up how she posts to be. <laughs> Y'all, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Angel, for joining me on another episode of Vault Empowers Talks. Be sure to share this with somebody who needs a little more expansion in their lives. Be sure to, sure to like. Be sure to make and leave a comment. Y'all, I'm so excited for what God is about to do with this show. So thank y'all for joining me. I'm your host, Brandi Harvey. Until next time, eat well, give a damn, move your body every single day. Peace. <laughs>